Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about redevelopments. I'm Jenny Mathiason, an objects conservator based in Kimmarthenshire. And I'm Chloe Rumsey, an objects conservator based in Manchester. Hey, hey guys. Hi, welcome to the show, our guest host. Yeah, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Yes, hello everyone. So I'm Sean Kelly. I am the Collections and Conservation Manager at the Paisley Museum Reimagined Project. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us in your, I imagine, fairly busy schedule. Happy to be here. Um, Do you briefly just want to tell us a little bit about what, like that sounds like a really elaborate title, like what what is happening at your museum? Yeah, of course. So Paisley Museum is a local authority run museum, if anyone doesn't know, and we closed kind of end of 2018 for a major redevelopment project, which includes a major renovation and expansion of the building. Um, and it will also include a complete redisplay of the collection when we reopen as well. So, oh wow! Uh, yeah, it's the it's probably the biggest project that the museum has undertaken since it opened, uh, and it's been open for about 150 years now. So, oh yeah, um, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> yep, it's a good chance to kind of look at a lot of our collections again, look at the, how we tell the stories and kind of what stories are being told. So, yeah, it's exciting, and we're also in addition to the displays, kind of make a lot of changes to the building that will make it more accessible and um, have kind of better facilities at it. So yeah, that's exciting. Sounds it. That's amazing. Is this the first redevelopment you're involved in? Um, at first, kind of one of the size, yeah, I have worked on another project, also Peace Museum, where we reopened a publicly accessible collection store in 2000 and mm. start of 2018, I think it was. Mm. Um, so I was on that project as well, moving the old collection store into the new collection store but it was on a much smaller scale than this ah so i'm thinking of that as part of the same project because it's obviously something that they knew about in the in the uh yeah kind of like master plan yeah uh, yeah they knew in the yeah they knew in the plan this is going to happen next so i'm thinking of that as part of the of one project but it's interesting you're thinking of as two separate ones also, I dare say it's probably better mentally in some ways to treat them as two different <laughs> projects. No, but only because no, but because then you get the completion, the feeling of like this bit is done yeah. and that is really healthy. And it's one of the favorite things that someone I know who's a project manager and who does uh, not just redevelopment projects, but like all sorts of collections based projects. It's one of our favorite things is that you can finish it. And then there might very well be a grand plan after that, that you may or may not be a part of, but that there's some sort of completion, like that you can put a little bow on it and walk away and go, yes, Check. I nailed that. Did it. <laughs> I think I started that collection store project 2016. Yeah, it would have been a long project if I was still on, I'm still mm. on that one. So it's, it is good to break them up. Yeah, I think it is better to be bite-sized. But it's also nice to have done both. The first collections move project, we moved in, I think it was about 60% of the, the museum's total collection um, from the previous collection store. Uh, and the other 40% mm. was held on site at the museum. So that was kind of nice to then be on both projects to, to see it all come under one roof. Yeah. I think that's that's the first time they've ever had nice. all of it under one roof. So that was good. What was the initial goal when the higher ups in the museum decided we're gonna do a redevelopment? What was the was it always to do a full scale redevelopment? And were those goals always to increase accessibility and redisplay and things like that? So well the, the original plan happened before before I came on board the project but mm-hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. yeah but I think that the main plan was to try and I suppose if you go right back Paisley bid for the city of culture um which would have been uh, 2021 mm-hmm. um so right mm-hmm. kind of alongside that there was like a big kind of push to do a lot of the redevelopment and the kind of cultural sites in Paisley and yeah so that was the kind of main uh, I guess mm. the, the idea is to kind of bring cultural sites back into the town centre and hope that they will hope that, that will kind of help with the town centre regeneration. It's fantastic that they decided to do it anyway. It, and because they obviously I imagine quite a lot of work went into doing the bid and talking about the project and then I suppose individually getting all excited about the different things they're going to do. That it's really good that they prioritise that 
is something to to do anyway. It's brilliant. And just so in case that people don't know, Paisley is 15 minutes drive from central Glasgow, isn't yeah. it? It's really, really close by. Yeah. When I visited you for work reasons, <laughs> which is how I met Sean, I was wandering around thinking, why have I never been here before? It's lovely. There's big squares and there's really wide streets. And yeah. the collection center is in something that I think is the absolute most genius thing ever. And I want Debenhams. <laughs> I want Debenhams for my museum. The collection center is in a retail space. Yeah. It was an old Littlewoods department store. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was a big, a, a big massive empty unit. And the uh, council took on and divided it up into individual collections rooms within the one building so i think that bit is happening more and more to be honest because it's currently happening here in where i live in kamal is it? the uh, local authority museum is putting a collection hub and stores in what used to be debenhams oh you got debenhams i want debenhams too <laughs> manchester debenhams please <laughs> <laughs> so it won't be the whole like department store uh it will be a shared space between i think health services and like a gym and like various mm-hmm. po- sort of bits that like you know are relevant to people that sort of thing but it, it will also include a collections hub and stores that you can go into and stuff like that so it will be an engaging space that is right in the middle of town which is really important because they're sort of arguably the main museum is actually out of town mm. which means that it's more difficult to get to it is heavily reliant on people having cars and stuff like that so this would not be which is a much better idea in some ways so it's uh, actually it's super cool to see uh, that's sort of i think early stages at this point like it's very much been announced as a mm. thing that's happening but it, it's not there yet mm. so it's it's not i haven't been able to snoop around <laughs> The previous collection store wasn't publicly accessible. So when we eventually moved into this one, um, we started public tours, although they haven't, they obviously stopped during COVID and they haven't um, restarted up. <laughs> Why would that yet. be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so yeah, I haven't quite restarted yet, but it, it's a good, it's like a really kind of visible mm. spot on the high street. So it's um, it'd be good when that does restart. And they'll, it'll stay there as well. So when the museum does reopen and it's back open to the public, the, it'll only be the display objects that will go back up. So the storage will still remain in that in that space. Mm-hmm. So it's and they're kind of at opposite ends of the high street as well. So it'll kind of keep a bit of connection with the location as well. That sounds really good. That's really cool. Chloe, have you ever worked on any redevelopment projects? I. So I feel like Sean's doing all the fun stuff <laughs> at the moment. And I've done all of the, like, slightly disappointing stuff. Okay, in what way? <laughs> so I've got a sort of distinction between a gallery redevelopment and mm. then museum full redevelopment, which is the kind of thing that it sounds like you're talking about, Sean. And then collections care redevelopment, which is another thing that you're talking about. So I've been involved in, I suppose, a spruce up of of the collection store section, like real, really trying to improve things and that sort of thing, which is wonderful. But I've also been on two sides of gallery redevelopment, which is essentially go in and take all the objects away. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the decant. And the decant. Yeah, and it's, decant. it's great. And obviously you go in and whilst you're there, you're like, oh, wow, lols, look how outdated this is. And yeah, they really want... Yeah, this is. Good grief, they liked mannequins in the early 90s. <laughs> like, that, all of that... Were these just glued down? <laughs> Weird. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, wow, museum gel is a bad idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it is essentially like the number of people I've talked to about, oh, what? where do you work? I work here or I have worked here. Oh, is that the one with those galleries? I loved that bit. And then you have to go, yeah, that's not there anymore because yeah. I took it away. <laughs> And it's just like, it's Ooh. sort of, it's, it's, and so one of them, um, is the medicine gallery decant in the science oh. museum in London. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was an absolutely fantastic gallery, two galleries. Um, I think my opinion might be different had I been, I've not actually been to the new one yet because it was part of two different projects and I was part of the first team that went in and took away all the things. But I really liked the galleries before. Like I've never mm. been, and I went in and thought, "Oh, this is good. It's really like 
eccentrically crammed in and there's sort of really really specific sections like medieval stomach pain section and like things like you know <laughs> really niche and I just took it all away and it was a bit of a it was a bit of a shame and I quite admired how they managed to s- sort of cram so much stuff in there yeah it is an interesting bittersweet feeling to take something away or to decant knowing that they probably won't make it back in yeah that's a weird feeling isn't it it is and the the one that i won't mention by name is one that's like really famous in the area in which the museum is in and there's loads of like really favorite objects and I know for a oh, fact that 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 project was halted for various like structural reasons. And now not only do I have to say, oh, no, that's not there anymore. It's like, oh, no, it hasn't been replaced by anything better. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> though those, yeah. That treasured yeah, memory man. you had is just walled in now. <laughs> and no one can go oh, and see yeah. it. So it's it's like I have not done the fun bit of like you go through the pain that first I, I imagine it's exciting to get rid of the to, you know to decant all the things yeah. and then you go through the pain of the, this is the object selection and it's like a it's like a, an exhibition install yeah object list on acid <laughs> that yeah, it's yeah. just like okay <laughs> so now this has to be permanent and these are all of the things that we need and oh we can't do that okay so i've not had that which is i suppose a bonus but i haven't had the satisfaction section yet yeah mm. okay and i suppose at the moment actually i'm which is something i want to get back to i'm working in a museum that is like 10 years after its redevelopment which is oh. again on the other end of the other end which is like oh so this is starting to fall apart now uh, it's interesting that you bring up gallery rust whole museum because i was going to say that i haven't been on like a full scale thing other than decanting galleries for a museum that was completely being refurbished oh, wow. um, but I, my part there was decanting it was very yeah, much get yeah, this yeah, out get this yeah. out get this out uh, <laughs> not in like an urgent sense more of a oh the deadline's approaching a lot faster than we thought this time progresses <laughs> that side of things and other than that I've only been like personally I guess involved with like gallery scale mm. revamps where it's like oh we're just going to completely redo this the, yes yeah, so I think the one that I actually saw from start to finish was just like a single room not even that big but it was being completely overhauled like get all the cases out put Mm. new cases in uh put cctv in because it was part of like government indemnity Mm. scheme and stuff like that so that you could borrow fancier things you made that sound so exciting and sexy (laughs) (laughs) it's so sexy (laughs) But it was more like, you know, paint the walls and uh, figure out what we're doing with the windows because it had two massive windows. So it was like, do we just completely shutter them? Do we like block them? Um, what do we do? And it's a historic building. Mm. So it was like a lot of like, how do we best do this in a sensitive way? And how do we make the most out of not a great room already, but what can we do to improve it, basically? Mm. And yeah, so that's the only one that I've seen sort of from start to finish. Like, decant, rip everything out put everything back together but better and then (laughs) put new things in it like that's the only one (laughs) i have kind of done some of the fun stuff like and i like on the (laughs) on the kind of the collection store project Mm. it it was just the decant essentially that that i worked on and moved that in so this the store was kind of designed before i came to that project ah for the museum i came on board at the point where we had just appointed our architects so oh nice i kind of had like a lot more involvement or in the kind of building side of things as well as like the exhibitions which is um mm-hmm. which has been really good and there has been like interesting conversations and fun things to be part of can we tunnel into building design and collections care mm-hmm. because i might from my you know hearsay and you know things that people have said about new builds museums it's essentially all architects want a water feature in all of the galleries <laughs> is that right <laughs> uh, <we> have... <laughs> and oh this kind of plaster really soaks up the water beautifully and then drips it all out over the objects is that your experience <laughs> <laughs> um we can i mean i don't know I, I, I don't think that i'm spoiling anything oh, by saying oh. that we, we don't have any water features in the museum um 
uh, thankfully, uh, from my perspective. There's um, no. I, I, is that because you went for the chocolate fountain? Yeah, isn't yeah, it? Chocolate fountain and at the end. I'm there. And, yeah, um, and all, just objects suspended uh, above it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, we I'd, like. Uh, yeah, I think there's a, like I've heard like a lot of like anecdotes and stories about kind of architects and designers wanting to do kind of off the wall things in museums, but. I didn't. I didn't feel like that anything that was suggested or spoke about was like completely from a kind of conservation or collections point of view. Mm. Like, ah, our, so our architects are ALA Amanda Levy architects. So they have a lot of experience in working with museums. So they've done work with VA. So um, it, it wasn't. It's not their first rodeo. <laughs> Yeah, it didn't feel like they were coming in to be like, let's throw all of the objects off the bridge. <laughs> you know I mean? like, so, um, kind of, they had an understanding of what kind of environmental requirements and stuff would be. But don't get mm. me wrong, like, there's obviously still competing factors. Um, yeah, you, you do have to kind of compromise at some points, but there wasn't anything that was too. Can we ask what one of the competing factors was? And in what way have you compromised? Before we closed, we did like a lot of um as our studies to see what people thought about the museum before and what they would want to get out of it and one of the main things that we got back was that the layout of the building was quite confusing it felt like there were like a lot of dead ends and part of that is the construction of the building so it's just been progressively added to uh, since it opened and it's also built into a hill so there's just there's, cool. i think there was something like that was like 15 different levels even though it's really only like three, wow. three or four floors yeah. so <sighs> it's just like it was quite difficult to move around so one of the things we wanted to do is kind of open it up a bit more so make it a more kind of circular building but also to have um, a bit more light in it and a bit more window access so you can kind of orientate yourself in terms of where you were in the building and um, but obviously light our favorite <laughs> so but we kind of worked, we worked with the architects to come up with kind of solutions that would bring some of the light back into the building without it being too kind of crazy or too unmanageable. Some of the art galleries uh, mm -hmm. have roof lights in them um, and they had been covered up in the past. So we opened some of them back up instead of just opening them back up to have mm. pure daylight shining onto the objects. There's got panels on them that are kind of perforated to kind of lower the, the light levels um, that were still lighting up the galleries, but not not damaged objects. It's an interesting point that because I feel like historic art galleries in particular, they were very much made to have the sort of skylights and that's mm. how they were lit. Yeah. That's how they yeah. were meant to be enjoyed. So it's both yeah. important in terms of as an architectural feature, but like the, it's the point. It's the point mm. of the galleries that it's lit like that. So it's it, it's an interesting yeah. dilemma to sort of figure out whether you, you want to retain that or to use that because mm. it's sort of the purpose of those rooms which is interesting and it makes it a really pleasant space as well yeah it does and lots of objects can take it yeah it definitely makes it more yeah. <laughs> lots yeah. of them are fine yeah. we're obviously in control of like what we put out as well and you know the the, the kind of exhibition approach we're taking is like a kind of story-based approach so it's not going to be like a gallery of textiles or a gallery of ceramics so it will be a mix but the idea is that over time, those those kind of individual displays could be or should, will, will be rotated out for different stories. So although we're putting things out and it will be out on longer term than kind of say a temporary exhibition, the idea is that we will kind of refresh the displays and it will get more of the objects out, but it also means that some of the objects will get a rest and they go back into storage. In case you don't know, Paisley has a big uh, textile industry uh, history. So a lot of people really associated it with the textile industry and uh, some people even just thought it was like a kind of textile museum but it's not like the, coll the collection of places really varied so it's got like, quite a big art collection big natural history collection social history big ceramic collection so uh, all in addition to the textiles so it's yeah it's kind of a good opportunity to get a lot more of the, the different collections out as well as the textiles and um, yeah it's really good so you mentioned like the um, accessibility earlier and changing the layout and stuff to, to really improve accessibility and stuff. Part of me is interested because when did the bid go in? The, the, it must have been 2015? Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't involved in the yeah. bid, I just kind of followed it. But 
2016 I started so I know the council oh, had been more wow. before that so, yeah yeah I so the reason I asked uh, the reason I'm interested in that is because quite a lot of the things that are happening in museums now like improving accessibility feels like it's happening in the last few years but of course in order to achieve these things you need to go through an extremely lengthy funding bid process so is it possible that it's just that we're just really late in actually implementing the things that's that we've been thinking, thinking about for a long time yeah I, maybe people yeah. were like yeah no maybe. we actually do need it to be properly accessible and back in 2015 but it's actually just it just takes so long to get any money for these things and then implement it all that it we're now in you know looking at 2023 and <laughs> and the, these things just feel like new things because this is I mean, when possibly. things are being implemented i think that's an interesting thought Especially considering like the bigger a project is, the more money you need, and yeah. the more sort of the more paperwork there is. Yeah, exactly. As yeah. if it's something small, like we'd like to redo uh, a gallery. Okay. Yeah, we'd like to replace just the panels in a gallery, mm. not even the objects. Uh, we can get a small part of funding for that. Then that's like a couple of days' work. Yeah, and still quite a lot of paperwork, but it's <laughs> it's less. It's, it's less. Um, <laughs> that's sort of an interesting thought that maybe it's the scale of a thing mm. here that's actually. Um, sort of affecting the pace the bid for 2021 would have gone in whenever it did but the the, the museum wasn't entirely like concurrent with that bid so like uh, the, the the development kind of stages would have happened after that so and even after we got we were successful in getting our funding we were still doing kind of still mm-hmm. having like design mm-hmm. conversations after that even up until recently we're still having some elements that can be still changed like still kind of writing parts mm-hmm. of the text uh, that kind of thing so there are still things that can be obviously there's no things that are set in place like the building the building works underway but things can still be implemented even like kind of put further down the line in the project i guess so if, if things if attitudes change or it doesn't need to be like so in 2015 we designed how to make this set of text really accessible and then seven years later we've realized that that's not the case <laughs> but it's actually just printed no. now so tough <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes yes uh, so there is the opportunity to change things yeah it does um, highlight some interesting things that maybe when things were costed up if they were costed up a fair number of years ago that maybe things don't cost that much anymore because oh man. actually they cost a lot more shit yes especially at the moment yeah but, i um, knew this came up in things like uh, ace funding and stuff like that so arts council england and stuff like that because they were really concerned that like do people want us to put our efforts into new bids for next year or do you want us to add money to the existing ones so they can actually happen because everything's much more expensive Shit. so they might not happen if we don't <gasps> give them extra money uh and, and like that's I a big concern i hadn't heard or considered that that's crazy yeah so like that's the thing so if if things you know if you have a quote from 2015 that's probably not going to be anywhere near what it costs <laughs> oh, now God. uh you know like that that can be another thing to consider that mm. maybe the money doesn't cover what it initially should have just because Thing, things are just more expensive. I think it is interesting to think about why we do redevelopments because it's. Yes. I feel like when you see the blurbs from a lot of places, because they do come up a lot, like even if you don't read like the museum's journal, even then, you know, like they pop up on BBC and The Guardian and all sorts of places where they're like, oh my God, big place. Or even, even sometimes medium place, <laughs> small place, does big thing. You know, like it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it does have to have, <laughs> tend to have that vibe to it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh my god a museum is changing something uh yeah that that does tend to be how it goes and yeah. uh, then it does tend to be like it does tend to headline with things like uh, better accessibility mm. or after public consultation or uh we need a bigger cafe or <laughs> <laughs> we need accessible toilets which is true yeah, yeah. and and that sort of thing so they, they do tend to it does tend to rank quite highly on on the list is uh better accessibility which is good so that does seem to be a common theme in these things that it's about that no one ever says we need to redevelop because the galleries are so wildly out- outdated or look how naff all this stuff is or well, that's offensive I don't now. know if I agree with that, but mostly because of, did you see the Welcome's recent tweets? No. no they recently, I have the Welcome um, on my mind map. Nice. It's something to talk uh, about. What have they said? No, they recently announced on 
Twitter that uh, they are closing their Medicine Man gallery. Oh. With sort of immediate effect. Like it was like, it's basically gone tomorrow was sort of what it was. What? Was it um, an emergency? <laughs> Did they no, find something horrific in there that nobody noticed? <laughs> <laughs> not at all instead it was because it's racist ableist sexist uh, uh, so, so basically it, it, yes <laughs> yeah it's for all of the right reasons yeah, right yeah. Uh, uh, i think i think people were a little bit shocked yeah. by the nature of the sort of because it wasn't like a fancy press release it was like a twitter thread of their thoughts about here are all the reasons why we don't want this gallery anymore and i thought it was really good yeah, apparently people hated it uh, I, I mean <laughs> Twitter can be a little bit contentious at the yeah, best of times. Uh, but pe- 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 yeah. People were quite yeah. mean about it. And I thought, actually, this is everything that we need. Mm. Uh, so they were sort of also asking the question, what is a museum good for? What would you like to see instead? That sort of oh. thing. And, and I think people felt like, oh, they're so woke. And I'm like, no, this is everything that we need. Yeah. And it's the welcome <laughs> but, as well. They've got weight yeah. behind them. So in fact, saying we're closing this because it's horrendous. <laughs> Yeah. It was sort of Woo. what they were saying. <laughs> they were, and more of that, and I everybody. really respect that. Yeah, I, I did, really respect did. that. They yeah. took a very different approach and yeah, I appreciated that's it. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So that is an example of, of having seen that, but it's very recent and it's the only one I can think of that have sort of come out and just said, nope, <laughs> we're done. We're done with that bit. <laughs> But yeah, mostly otherwise, I would say that it does tend to lead with accessibility and things like that. Mm. It usually tries to sweeten the deal with we'll have a better gift shop and a cafe yeah. and, uh, and more interactives and stuff like that. I seem to recall that in your little blurb that said the why, it was also the who decides, like who decides that we get to have a redevelopment. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Who who thinks that up? And I mean, I, I strongly suspect that it's it's somewhat very high up the food chain yes. going, I have a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's... I'd love to say it's people led, but I don't think it is. I think the people get added in later generally where it's like, we would like to change things. <laughs> oh shit, we need to ask the public. Um, <laughs> what, what, what would you like? <laughs> I think that's usually how it goes. <laughs> See, that interests me as well because I have this sort of, like, surely, is this mean? Surely collections care don't get a choice. Right, because obviously, if Collections Care had a choice, we'd be changing museum galleries and stores all over the place all the time. So, is this directors? Is this trustees? Uh, I'm going to go yes. Is this is this chair of something something? Because then that's really that's really nice because that means that there are trustees and directors out there who go into the museum and think, yeah, let's do this differently. Yeah, that's true. That's that's a good yeah. way of pitching it. Uh, I was going to say, and obviously, in local authorities, will be yes. things like councillors yes. and stuff like that. So it, it you know, it's it takes all sorts. But yeah, it'll, it'll be the people at the top of the food chain, and if they take an interest, I suppose they do want to change mm. things. I guess it. I guess it's maybe a sign of disinterest if people don't want to change things in some ways. So yeah, that's sort of interesting to think about. I have this wonderful mental image of um, like the chair of trustees or whatever, like going to the museum with their grandkids or something and they're like wearing jumper and jeans and something totally incognito and then they look around at the 80s mannequins and like hell i need to do a redevelopment (laughs) (laughs) like oh we're gonna need some money exactly oh god (laughs) one can hope Yeah. One can hope that it's from a visitor point yeah, of view where it's yeah, like, oh no, it. this is atrocious. Yeah. I mean, we know in reality, we know that assessments are done and we know that, you know, the future of museums is always being assessed by trustees and, and all of that. But, um, I just, ha- I just love the idea of someone just being like, I love it. oh God, having a proper lucid moment about <laughs> what, <laughs> what it looks like. Oh no, it doesn't look nice anymore. Oh, terrible. Uh. <laughs> I mean, in Paisley, I guess the, those conversations must have happened during, yeah, like a long time ago. Mm. Someone at some point, yeah, someone at some point must have been like, "Let's do a bit about culture." So there must have been people out, the people in the council and the, in the town thinking about that anyway. But so I don't know if it's just the bit that's focused out or if people had these attitudes anyway. But a lot of people do yeah. have opinions on the medium. And oh like, yeah, what, most people will what, actually have opinions if like, you ask them. What it looks like, yeah, it's inevitable that anything that we do change will upset some people but hopefully it will delight others so <laughs> it's it's a very difficult yeah. thing i say that because i um on my list of examples is ipswich museum which is undergoing uh some redevelopment however i did Boudicca also away 
Ipswich is one of my childhood museums. It's got a big giraffe and Boudicca. I think they're gone. Boudicca was scary in the 90s. Sorry, please carry on. <laughs> this sounds very intense. Can, do you have childhood photos of this? Yes, this sounds I was immense. a mammoth. <laughs> oh my God, please show me. This is amazing. Uh, this is everything I want in life right now. This is great. Um, I love my that. That's great. museum memories. I love it. That's great. <laughs> um, sorry. I don't know, but I do know that there's definitely some upset because the two things that come up next to each other when you search, when you Google that is Ipswich Museum is undergoing redevelopment and a really angry petition about them doing a redevelopment. Oh no, can I look it up? Is that going to be disruptive? That's, uh, you go for it, why not? Uh, you have. I didn't realise that you had personal stakes oh in this. My I should never have brought this up. I know, oh so much. Well, I'm, <laughs> from, Colchester. I'm from Colchester and um, I mean, oh, yeah, fair the, the uh <gasps> Eight point seven million pound <laughs> yeah. redevelopment. Ooh, means temporary closure. Obviously, do you think we're going to do it around people? Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is. I, I do love when people are horrified by the by their mu- local museum closing for a bit because it's being rede- redeveloped, and it always is the top question in the FAQ or whatever. Is it open? No, it isn't. We can't do that. You can't have a little hard hat for the day. That's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't like repair, you can't like yeah. take the roof lights out and like just like, have people walk below them. <laughs> you like a little umbrella. Like. <laughs> Today you need to wear breathing equipment because the cement dust is too harmful. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. It switched museum under threat from historically insensitive redevelopment. Oh, so people got really upset. VictorianSociety.org.uk. Oh, there we go. Oh, and there's photos of the inside. I, I was reading the actual petition, which was saying something about a bird room being removed or something. And, okay. And, and stuff like that. Like, pe- pe- people had specific things mm. they were upset about. It wasn't down with this, people are changing things. It was like specific bits that they were upset about. Um, but mm. the, the, the point that I was trying to make was that you always, always upset someone. Um, yeah. And uh, that's just in the nature of things. Is it bad that I, I have, there's elements of me that agree? What? No, you're absolutely allowed to agree, of course. <laughs> oh, I forgot about the rider. The rider was horrific. <laughs> I love the, the, all of your favourite things about it are taxidermy. It feels like it, it, it's always taxidermy. It is, people, isn't it? it it's funny like that. Like, it's always the taxidermy That's a good people point. remember. And that is the number one thing that people usually want to remove for some reason. And I'm like, why? People love it. <laughs> you really hit a nerve. <laughs> No, I, I'm fine with that. That proves my point. That yeah, it yeah, can, yeah. It can be very emotional when, mm. when places go through redevelopments. And, and, and sometimes it's about what comes off display, what happens to the building, or it can be really emotional because there's people's memories and stuff like that. Like with us, like it's funny that you talked about the, 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 again the tax thing because with us the question that I feel like I get asked most is we have a lion in the collection that has been out on display for a long time and first question is like is the Aww. lion going back in? What are you doing with the lion? Like everyone remembers the lion. So, and is the lion um, going back in? Yeah, I still I don't think that it is a spoiler. I think I can say that Yay! the lion okay, is going okay, back good. in. So it is good news okay. for the lion. <laughs> Does the lion have a name? <laughs> He's he's making his way back in. Yeah, does the lion yeah. have a name? That's a very important question. He does have a name. Uh, I, th- I think he was named okay. for the public it's some time ago, but his Buddy name the is lion. Buddy. Um, Adorable. But like it's, uh, so people from Paisley are called mm-hmm. buddies. So uh, kind of Adorable. Like buddy Love it. It's funny, That's yeah, because the, my 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 old place of work also had a had a line that people came in to to say hi to, and his name was Nelson. <laughs> he was named by the Sioux that originally had him. <laughs> <laughs> when he was alive nice nice i think if somebody had said to me so i'm from colchester and obviously my my primary childhood actually no i went to ipswich museum more because it was free colchester castle was always a little bit more expensive but we did go and there were school trips and stuff Boudica is no longer there and had somebody <gasps> told me that it was leaving you know that that it was all changing. I probably would have been like, "Oh, but what? Oh, that's you can't do that." <laughs> but I have since, as an adult, <laughs> gone back to the redeveloped castle. It's fantastic. It's like yeah, there's there's so many things that are excellent about it, and I'm delighted. So I feel like people potentially have a tendency to 
really nail down on the lion that they're not uh, that they might have taken away or yeah. the you know whichever specific bit that they remember having a photo of themselves taken in front of and stuff <laughs> i mean it's pretty human to do that to be honest and at least it means yeah. that people are emotionally yeah, yeah, invested yeah. in your museum which is actually yes, a pretty big deal it is uh, even if they also mm. then have to get a little bit upset sometimes yeah so that's but it's a sign of love even yeah. when they're angry and break petitions <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's switch. <laughs> yes. Speaking of strong emo- emotional attachments, I read a pretty interesting thing. This is slightly a tangent, but sort of not. You may or may not be aware that Museum of London is moving and basically making a new site for itself, and mm-hmm. it's going to be London Museum after that. Uh, oh, so it's part of a, yeah. it's part of a rebrand and a redevelopment. Mm-hmm. But they're no, they're moving away from the Barbican building that they've been in for forty odd years, mm-hmm. and uh, essentially, people are now quite concerned what's going to happen to the building that the museum oh. used to be. And essentially, people are now upset about what's going to happen to the actual building that's left over because the, I was going to say local authority, is it still called local authority in London? I don't know. Uh, or is it like the borough or something? I don't know. Um, <laughs> God. I don't know. The people in charge of that bit of London, <laughs> the people in charge of that bit of London, they want to de- they want to demolish it and build offices because of course they do, it's London. Wow. Uh, and sense- but, well, you know, there's barely any offices in London. So clearly something they need um and essentially the locals are sort of up in arms about it because essentially they're like well there's no real reason to first of all you promised us a concert hall that you're not building nice. and instead you're going to put off offices which we don't agree to <laughs> and also is there really any reason when you've all committed to having a greener building policy to then demolish an existing building which is the greener alternative to keep and repurpose mm-hmm. and then build some new concrete monstrosity that's going to release one heck of a lot of stuff into the environment and fall uh, down so, in 20 years so even though it's not necessarily the prettiest building mm-hmm. ever it's interesting that people are willing to if fight you like for brutalism it. it's gorgeous yes definitely <laughs> but uh, i sort of like that people are attached to the building mm. and they're like hang on i don't know that we want to look at another block of offices like could we just not do something with this yeah Uh, so sometimes people are attached to the actual building as well as the entity of the museum if you see what i mean and the collection i think that's lovely it's another example like sean's of the the local community yeah people care at the museum that i work at about 12 ish years ago we Mm -hmm. way before my time there we had a huge redevelopment opened um, in 2010, new galleries had the old museum building, which is the pump house that was built onto, had a huge extension built onto, archive, galleries, floors one and two, conservation studio, arc, you know, strong room, cafe, gift shop, all of this. Really fantastic. But that was over 10 years ago now. And it's getting to the point where there are things about the building that are starting to slow down and break down. And obviously we had, I have no idea how much money we got for the redevelopment, again, before my time. Loads, of, a shit ton of money, like a million uh, kind of money. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it would have been more than that. Lots of money, like at least 50 pounds, you know. Um <laughs> And so, for example... Just a really big novelty really, check. Yeah, really big novelty check. And so, for example, <laughs> things like the heating system is starting to crap out in various places. Ooh. And there are elements of the galleries that we're thinking, no, we want to change that. And Or, or for example, like... The, so it's um, chronological galleries, swoon. And the upstairs is the recent stuff. And we've got a fantastic section on the NHS and the, the you know, strikes and all of that. But our disability section is tiny. Our migration section is tiny, as is the LGBT plus section. And we've got like... Politics has moved on. It's a politics museum, obviously. Things have moved on so much in the last 10 years. We've got nothing on Black Lives Matter at all. We want to change it, but it's only been 10 years-ish since we changed it last time. What do we do? It's going to cost like hundreds of thousands of pounds to just change the cooling system on its own. (laughs) So that's that's a really big deal. 
And so we are looking as a museum to redevelop again. But in the meantime, we're doing stuff like changing panels to be more inclusive and use, you know, the more sort of agreed on language and add extra bits and stuff like that. But I don't have a solution. It's just a sort of center of interesting observations that we put all of this work in and potentially it could be nearly 10 years in the running towards a redevelopment project and all of the work you put in and then 10 years after that you might be looking at doing it again I realize this could be really insensitive <laughs> Sean because you're like why do you <laughs> shut up <laughs> like, no. <laughs> no I I think it's I think it's like definitely something that we've thought about I think there's things that you can do as part of as part of a redevelopment yeah. project to try and minimize some of that and we think it is kind of good to have mm. a kind of impetus to try and refresh the museum again I mean refresh is a really good word and, but like, also it keeps it more bite-sized but if, it's if just the like, work it, is ongoing yeah. then you don't have to save it all up for that magical day when you sort of win the lottery if you mm. see what I mean like it's if you could do the work a little yeah. bit at a time and obviously you can't with like something massive like we need to replace the entire heating system that's a little <laughs> bit more involved however with things yeah, like we can okay. refresh this or we can change mm. the, the panels here or we can actually decant a uh, case and give up give more space to mm. something like black lives matter then those are things that are achievable that is the kind of thing mm. that we're doing yeah definitely yeah. it's an interesting thing if you say a redevelopment in the next few years, do you mean 10 years or do you mean 20 years? Because if it's, yeah. or, you know, if it's going to be more time than five years, then potentially it's worth spending small chunks of money to redo the panel that says something racist. If you're going to be doing that, then potentially, do you want to wait until you can go wholesale? But then if this is a difference between like, 60 grand over the next 10 years or 5 million pounds and then in 20 years what will 5 million pounds get you probably a second hand car <laughs> and <a> cheesecake <laughs> yeah. it's just it's yeah. just I, I mean the thing about museum work is yeah. it doesn't stop right mm. it doesn't stop when we've like sealed that case and we walk away i could we have to keep doing Skip it. Skip off into <laughs> the sunset. Yeah, exactly. We yeah. have to keep doing it. <laughs> Just like we have to keep looking after the objects, as we have to keep reinterpreting or mm. redisplaying or thinking about how we're welcoming people in and stuff mm. like that. Like it's, it's not like it stops. <laughs> yeah. uh, done. Forever. Never going to change a thing. <laughs> that's done. that done. No. Redeveloped. Tick. <laughs> yeah. No, that's not how it works. <laughs> I think especially if you're in some like, kind of local authority or a regional museum where your audience is more local and although we are aiming to have mm. a kind of we're aiming to increase our audience to get more people in but like ultimately like the local community will be your main audience if you compare that to something somewhere like one of the big kind of nationals or in london or in edinburgh that your visitors are less likely to be repeat visitors so it's it's not as bad to have those mm -hmm. exhibitions out for a long time but if you have if you've got you know how well are you really serving your local community if you've just got the same stuff out for like 25 30 years and it doesn't change it's not really like just think if you're bringing your kids every mm. you know once a month for something to do then it's the same stuff all the time it might how i find i find this fascinating because it, um, on the one hand i completely agree and on the other hand i've seen so many people come in with their grandkids for that one thing they want to show them because <laughs> they were shown that when they yeah. were little yeah then that we're back lion, to the the lion. Lion. <laughs> <laughs> Back to that thing. Like, I'm here just for that, and I don't care about anything else in this building. They have to be petrified by the yeah. lion, same yeah. as I was. <laughs> so you, you do yeah, get a bit of true. both, but there's got to be some sort of balance there, where maybe like the like really firm favorites can mm. maybe stay somehow. Mm. That that can't mm -hmm. be the firm favorite that's really racist. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's like maybe can't be that one. Yes. Um, <laughs> I would like to just put some sparkle around the phrase you just said, say, serving your local community. Because that's just such a love. Yes, that's, yes, this is what we're doing. We're serving the communities. This is their stuff. Yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the aims of the project to be more kind of community driven and community led. Tell us when it's opening. When's your deadline is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, we don't have a date, a date, an exact opening date yet, but we're due to open early 2024. Very nice. There's some time still. There's some t- loads of time. Loads of time. Loads of time to to conserve all those objects that are in my backpack. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like this is the point where we say good luck. Not that you need it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> of course not. And you'll totally nail it. Yeah. <laughs> but you've got a year until the big install is probably happening whenever that yeah. happens. So yeah. that's plenty of time, right? Still a good amount of time to, to do plenty of work. Before <laughs> you say. That, so just, yeah. Slightly <laughs> panicked <laughs> face. <laughs> you see in my eyes there. <laughs> no, but it's good. It's, it'll be good. It'll be good to see it complete. Be good, like, as we were saying, to start to, like, tick it off and be like, oh, done. Lock, lock the case and open the doors. That'd be good. Oh, that's, that's a really, really nice. nice point to end on. Lock the case and open the doors. I'm Georgina Young and I'm the Head of Collections and Exhibitions at Manchester Museum, which is part of University of Manchester. And our project at the moment is Hello Future and it's a capital development with a value of about £15 million. Wow. Um, Yeah, it's a lot, which includes two new spaces a special exhibition gallery in a South Asia gallery and then a reconfigura- reconfiguration of some of our existing galleries. So we're creating a new Chinese culture gallery, a new belonging gallery, a new dinosaurs display. So it's quite big and quite it spans quite a lot of different subject matters, types of collection, um, ideas, kind of bits of the world. It's kind of it's fairly wide ranging in terms of the scope of what we're working on at the moment. So what were the goals of the redevelopment from an institutional point of view? The ambitions of the capital project are the same as the ambitions of the museum. So we aim to create a more sustainable world and understanding between peoples. You know, that's that's it's big, but that's what we try and do. And the capital project kind of follows that follows that ambition. Um, and I suppose within that, we've also got three key values as a museum. So we want to be the most caring, inclusive and imaginative museum that you can imagine. So those are the things that sort of values that drive it. And then as a kind of additional sort of thing, we, we sort of say that we're trying to become the museum that 21st century Manchester needs and wants. So it's about recalibrating a museum that's established in the 19th century that has a kind of imperial root into something that actually works for the city of Manchester today and bridges the kind of um, civic museum and university museum remits that we hold. So we, we kind of were a bit of both um, and we're sort of unique in that. I suppose that's one of the special things that we're holding on to through the project that we're here for the city, we're here for the university as well. And about your sort of work, your collections goals, your own personal goals for the project? So there's loads of sub goals to the project. Mm-hmm. But, um, <laughs> every gallery sort of has its own ambition. I guess the biggest sort of overarching ones are about a kind of really wholehearted commitment to co curation and uh, people being not just consulted but genuinely involved in the creation of of Mm -hmm. the stories and the stories so that's kind of across across the board and it's both most fully realized in the South Asia gallery which has a collective of 31 co-curators who've been developing stories with us over a period of five years now so that is you know um that's been a very particular um journey and I suppose it's the most thoroughly and length thorough and lengthy co-curation that we've got across the whole museum but generally speaking we've got a principle of indigenizing Manchester Museum as well which Mm -hmm. we've had a a program with you for two years so we're trying to make sure that where we've had the belongings of indigenous peoples from across the world that they have a say in how those belongings are shown whether Mm -hmm. they're shown what's said alongside them so so things like the belonging gallery um, really sort of bring through that indigenizing Manchester Museum remit and kind of have a very polyvocal approach to storytelling around objects so so those are kind of there's there's quite a lot about storytelling there's also a very big kind of move um Manchester Museum's always had a split between nature and culture so half the museum is natural sciences half the museum is human cultures and nowhere in the middle did they ever meet and so one of the things that we're trying to do now is in terms of building sustainable world and understanding between cultures is actually like these missions are actually not separate these are the same thing they are both two sides of the same coin so so another kind of big sort of intellectual job on our hands is about trying to break down that kind of hard line between nature and culture and I suppose on a more kind of collections point of view again it all ties into the ambition of the project overall so if we say we want to make a more sustainable world then we need to try and limit the amount that we're using our air handling units and mm. we need 
try and we need to try and make sure that our cases are well sealed and are kind of internally controlled so that we're con conditioning the kind of the object that needs it not the whole space so so there are kind of collections and conservation kind of bits of those big missions that are kind of you know really important to contributing to achieving what we want to achieve and I mean the conservation team have also worked with hundreds upon hundreds of volunteers over the last few years we've got one really large object it's a Japanese incense burner that's going into our uh, welcome spaces and it's it's had thousands of hours of conservation it's been surface cleaned it's three over three meters tall wow it had a very unpleasant kind of finish to it <laughs> when, when we started and you know they, they're doing the final sections at the moment to kind of finish the surface clean on that and it's incredibly ornate and it's incredibly slow work and there's no way that my um three and a bit conservators could have done it <laughs> without some help mm -hmm. um, but also it wouldn't it wouldn't have been as true to our mission without the help so there's been quite a lot of yeah um, thinking about how we involve people in the conservation work that leads to the finished result and also how we talk about that in gallery so we'll talk about those volunteers and we'll talk about those conservation hours because you know what the sort of the fact that so many hands went into making the museum is a really important message it's part of what we're trying to do and slightly off script what's the incense burner made out of I think people will need to know <laughs> um, <laughs> what the materials that are present. <laughs> all the materials. Um, oh God, not all of them. That's this isn't the test. <laughs> it's, it's, it's predominantly a, a, a copper alloy. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, I would say that we did find some asbestos in it, which obviously wasn't original. Lovely. <laughs> So we had the same problems as everyone else in that, you know, there are hazards in our collections and we mm -hmm. don't necessarily know where they until we start working on them. So that was a bit of a, um, I mean, unfortunately, it was kind of as soon as it was noticed, everyone just down tools and, you know, moved. But everybody out. Um, but, you know, we do, it does happen that when you actually come to look at a, an object properly for the first time, sometimes in decades, mm. then then you're kind of finding hazards and issues with that object for the first time and the capital project kind of because it occasions you to look at objects for the first time in decades means that you know that's that's a portion of the work sometimes you find someone stuffed something with asbestos for no <laughs> no logical reason <laughs> yeah we, we still haven't quite worked out who did it then. thank you for that little sideline um so what's your <laughs> biggest conservation concern been during the project maybe we can take the asbestos as red <laughs> Because I think that's yeah. asbestos tends to be everyone's main conservation concern. Yeah. Like, so hazards in collections, yeah, is a, it, <laughs> collections has been a big um, conservation concern. I mean, just the sheer number of objects that have had to be decanted and recanted. So it's not just the galleries that we're doing from scratch, but because the, our extension is basically in a courtyard in the middle of the building, that's mm. meant that we've had to move or protect thousands of objects. So. And what we're doing now is not just putting in new galleries, but putting back old galleries. So just mm -hmm. it's just the kind wow. of sheer, sheer numbers of objects that we're talking about handling, moving is um, it's been quite a quite a feat for the project on a cons on conservation terms. I think it's also just it's kind of keeping everyone motivated because it takes these projects take such a long time, mm. and there are points you can't see the end, um, and there are points where the amount of work just seems overwhelming um so it's you know one of the key things is just about people so conservators you know are people and they need to be motivated and they need to kind of you know feel valued just like any other member of the team so you know part of it is just keeping people going on a capital project because they can you know they're long and they have they have hard bits so i think that's probably one of the other big challenges so finally then, what's your biggest win been in the project? And this can be conservation related or not conservation related. <laughs> the biggest win. Oh, it's really hard to answer that before you've actually finished. I know. I I'm sorry. <laughs> actually, basically, until the public are in the building again, until we see how people respond to what we've done, mm. we, don't, we don't know. Yeah, um, okay. We, things that we're really proud of and we think are going to be amazing, but... Mm. The, you know our measures of success aren't whether we think it's great really I mean that's nice but that's not really the primary mo kind of ambition of the project you know we want the people who come through the doors to think it's great so I think um it'll be really hard to say what our biggest win is until 
until we've had that kind of first flush of visitors and we've got a sense of what people are responding to. In terms of the process, I think the biggest win is kind of, um, and, and from a conservation point of view, is that the conservators have been in the room with the co-curators, um, understanding what their intentions are, uh, trying to kind of match that with what the conservation needs of the objects they want to use mm-hmm. are, kind of to trying to sort of navigate that and being really open to thinking differently with people who are not the usual curators that they work with. So I think that's, you know, that's been a, a really positive thing in, in terms of process. And and while we've been doing the capital development, we've also been, you know, moving forward our kind of repatriation and restitution work as well. And And again, the sort of conservation team have been absolutely embedded in that work. That kind of switch of thinking from the object being predominantly its material characteristics to really sort of seeing it animation it, mm-hmm. it's meaning as and kind of that's been a really um positive thing as well the on a conservation side in terms of the process it's just that everything that the conservation team does is absolutely fundamentally tied to the mission of the museum and you know they've been very wholehearted in in kind of sometimes setting aside some professional assumptions in order to look afresh with with our co-curators or with the people who to whom we might be returning objects and think well maybe that isn't the most important thing about this object maybe something else is the most important thing about this object so it's been it's been quite um personally for a lot of the team and for, for me as well that's been that's been one of the kind of biggest things that we've got through the project but yeah the the the, the, the test really is once we're open then we'll then we'll know what was what was the biggest um success and when do you open? Oh, the 18th of February. Okay. So we're 10 weeks, something like that, wow. uh, away. Very, very close. So, yeah, it's very much trying to keep going, mm-hmm. trying to trying to kind of take each day as it comes and kind of be quite nimble in terms of keeping to what we need to do and flexing around the things. It's like, oh, no, that one's not the most important one today. We're going to uh-huh. switch to that one. <laughs> it's, it's quite um yeah it's quite a nice it's a nice time in some ways because you can see everything come together but obviously it's a it's some kind of a little bit of a sprint to the end yeah yeah well thank you so much for taking the time to talk with the c word and i think we're all wishing you luck for the 18th of february 2023 for your grand opening and good luck to everyone on the team as well yes Thank you, and thanks on their behalf as well. So my name's Alex Gropper. Um, I'm the curator and deputy um, chief exec of Manchester Jewish Museum. And we last year um, reopened, and we've been closed for over 18 months um, because we had a, a large extension to our historic synagogue building, um, which included a new gallery, um, a new collection store, a cafe, a learning studio, and better loose. Brilliant. So what was the goal behind the bid for the redevelopment and the extension? I know some, yeah, there were some very practical things. We'd been, um, the, the former museum opened in 1984 um, and everything happened in the historic synagogue building. Mm-hmm. So it meant our exhibition was um, on the former ladies' gallery. It was a very difficult space, you know, and to actually exhibit anything. Um, and it was really dated. By that point, the gallery hadn't changed since 1985. And wow. so although, the you know, the content was still really interesting, um, the mediums in which we communicated were no longer kind of appropriate for a new museum audience. And more importantly, um, it was a topic-led um, approach to the way they did the gallery, but it was also a bit chronological. And mm-hmm. um, it ended in 1945. Wow, so, at the end of <laughs> the timeline. Visited, yeah, they, nice. would, they would think that nothing happened in Manchester Jewish community post-45, and a lot happened. So we were really conscious that there was a huge gap mm-hmm. there. Um, and there was also just some stories that we wanted to tell that weren't on the gallery. So that was one big issue. And then the other one was just space. We had no... We had a tiny a cupboard as our collection store and then we borrowed storage space from other museums and places and um, we had you know schools and groups and visitors all in the same space all the time um, and we really wanted to um, give them 
you know space to explore and 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 see the best of the building without all being on top of each other and um, and then we really really wanted a cafe not just because we think it it was complete and easy and visit um but food and Jewish culture is mm-hmm. are so interconnected and food plays a part in so many things that we really thought it would be part of the museum experience to um to have some food as part of it and what we've ended up with is a cafe that it's not just your traditional foods it's it's um some traditional recipes but with a, a twist and with our own take on it so sometimes it's a manchester twist sometimes it's the fact that we've we're a vegetarian cafe and so we've got things on the menu like your traditional smoked salmon bagel but our um smoked salmon is is carrot so we have nice. carrot so it's it's twists and it's playful but it, you are like learning about um you know jewish heritage and cuisine at the same time that's fantastic that's really cool. And who were your funders? So our, our major funder was the National Lottery Fund. Um, and then we had um, several other. We got some money from the Association of Jews for Refugees. We got some money um, from lots of different trust and organisations um, and then some individual donors as well. But yeah, the main funding came from the lottery. And what did you want to achieve with the collection? So as we were thinking about the gallery, you start to realise the gaps. Yeah. In the collection. Yeah. Um. So, you know, there was things that I wanted to say in the gallery, and I realised we didn't have the objects or the oral histories to do that. Um. And so, as part of the development of the gallery, and as we were as we were working up the project, um, we launched um two different schemes. One was called the Object Project, <laughs> and nice. one was called. called <laughs> And one was called Extraordinary Voices. And um, the object project was me literally putting myself in every Jewish setting I could find across Greater Manchester. So there was a do going on, I'd pop up there with a table and, and just asking people what stories they thought should be on gallery. And also if they had anything in the houses that, you know, should be in the museum and could be in the museum. Um, because a lot of people don't don't think them objects are museum worthy and they are. We've got a very everyday kind of collection here and so little tiny things people you know I as part of that project for example I accessioned a someone's shopping list from the 80s from their Paysack shop and, you know it's just little things like that that I think are amazing that they don't realize and don't think a museum would be interested in so the other project was getting physical things and then the Extraordinary Voices project was expanding on our already incredible or history collection um targeting um, people to represent the diversity of uh, Manchester's Jewish community today and so um, I talked to people and tried to find people who represented the diversity of religious observance and um, we wanted to increase our interviews with LBG plus community um, we wanted to represent the diversity of feelings towards um, Israel it was we had all these uh, aims of, of just spreading that that net of who we talked to that you know in the 1980s when the collection originated you know they weren't the the, the stories that they were after it was really about um trying to catalog um movement and migration of people and then there was a there was a project looking at interviewing holocaust survivors and refugees so it was just the next stage in that progression of who we wanted to talk to as part of the history collection and a lot of those interviews then, you know, did go on gallery um, in, in the redevelopment. Wonderful. So you're about a year from the opening. You opened in 2021, just, just over a year. Yeah. What's the mm-hmm. reception been like? And has there been any residual work you've been doing since reopening? Reception's been great. We've we've got really positive feedback from um, from press when we first opened and then from the visitors. Um we're getting many more visitors than we used to get in our former life um and we're getting you know in terms of visitor feedback our ratings we're getting you know, the high um remarks um so it's been really positive in terms of work we've been doing um you know we reopened in a lockdown scenario mm-hmm. we were developing this project in lockdown you know things were happening from everyone's homes so it was really challenging so yeah some things didn't get done on time and we had to open without them for really practical reasons for example there was an interactive um that's now up um in the gallery which was i interviewed um 11 different um jewish mancunians and asked the same six questions 
Um, and there were questions like, what does Sabbath mean to you? Is there anything in your wardrobe that makes you feel Jewish? Um, what languages do you hear? You know, it's, it's things like that. And the point was that you we had a huge variety of answers to that. And it's making, the, you know, there's such diversity in terms of um, observance and, and tradition amongst the Jewish community in Greater Manchester. That didn't get done because I couldn't physically go and interview people and I really yeah. wanted to do it in person. And so we chose not to do it over Zoom and to do it, wait until we could do it in person and I could build people and face to face. And so that wasn't on Gallery Open, but it is now. So there's a few projects like that that extended. We wanted to launch an online collection at the same time as reopening and that didn't happen um, because of time restraints. I went on maternity leave mid-project, so that, that was back about <laughs> nine months. So that project is ongoing now and we're trying to do that. So yeah, there's there's little, little overflows from that. Other than that, it's just continue what we do so our programming on site you know it's a continuation of of the work we were doing when we were closed um we do a process here called scratch where we try things out so it's an iterative development process and you try things out in the early stages and test them and we did a lot of scratching of events when we were closed um that we're now seeing kind of happening in the space when we're still scratching new ideas so it's kind of been a continual journey and i think where we acknowledge that you know we are learning ourselves and and growing as as we develop and you know the visitors feedback is really important to that so we can hopefully just get better and better and put programming people want to see brilliant thank you so much for speaking to the c word no problem thank you for having me I'm Chris Weeks and I'm the Collections Care and Conservation Manager at Manx National Heritage. Well, the Manx Museum actually was just sitting in uh, on the Isle of Man in Douglas. And um, you have asked me about uh, developments that we have made to the mm-hmm. museum. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Isle of Man is peculiar because it's an independent jurisdiction. We don't have access to Heritage Lottery Fund and those big... Uh, those big sources of funding that um, UK institutions sometimes can touch. So when we do capital um, redevelopments, um, they have to be pretty much homegrown. And around about the time when I joined this organisation in 2007, the financial crash decimated our funding stream. We did previously have a programme of gallery redevelopment to improve the displays at the Max Museum in particular, but mm. not solely. We do have 13 sites, monuments and museums around the Isle of Man on a sort of rolling basis, and that all just went out the window. Mm. Um, we have obviously continued to um, update things and, and redisplay galleries and redevelop uh, parts of the estate, but um, it's the, the flow has been strangled quite severely. I'm sure everybody will recognise those kinds mm. of um, financial problems. We've all suffered them, haven't we, mm. um, since 2008-9. And um, the ones that spring to mind, we've got, we got one that's going on at the moment and one that we finished in 2018. Um, the one in 2018 was um, the first dedicated um, gallery space um, on the subject of military history that my colleague Matthew Richardson, curator of social history here, had been working very hard to try to achieve for a number of years. And a lot of thought went into that. And we were able to um, uh, use that project as a springboard to have a lot of our um, very highly significant late late 18th century, early 19th century military costumes um, conserved and mounted. So that was a fantastic thing. But it's typical of the kind of projects that we've had in that um, the redevelopment was uh, of a neglected part of the museum Mm -hmm. complex, Mm -hmm. which is a a difficult space to work in. Mm. (laughs) And it's not not a new build project and none of the the things that we're doing are. Um, So it's almost like a sort of... Was a sort of a, a large glorified snaking corridor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but little did we know how easy that was um, by comparison to what came next. If we'd have known, I think we would have probably quailed a bit. Yes. Yeah, so next, we um, we decided that the time was right 
Uh, the story is very complex, so I won't burden you with it. But um, we might here, have heard some of it in June, anyway. Yeah, we might have done. So You're here in the, the midst of it now. We have uh, this um, this motorsport heritage on the on the Isle of Man, centred around the tourist trophy races, the TT races, and it uh, the decision was taken quite some years ago now to um, create a, um, a visitor experience mm. exploring the history and culture of that phenomenon. And uh, we have um, designated uh, an extremely ancient gallery built in the 1930s uh, and not wholly changed since then as the space that we would redevelop for that. Mm. And just as we were getting going, having um, appointed a design team and so on to redevelop this very large space, for us a very large space, in in the basement of the original museum here, Covid hit. Yay! <laughs> so we had to we had to conduct all of our site meetings, um, all of our preliminary site meetings and our design meetings via Zoom. Mm-hmm. The museum designers, apart from their preliminary visit when they were when they were touting for the work, had not seen the space and had not had a chance to see it. us. They've never witnessed the TT. <laughs> yeah, they've never actually visited the TT Festival because the TT Festival was cancelled. Of course. Because of COVID. Yeah. And they weren't able to travel anyway. Mm. So it's been a very inauspicious time to be building a, a, a TT motorsport mm. gallery. Um, but it just meant that we had to work extra hard on the communication. We had more meetings and more discussion and... and um, we had to get involved in more of a nitty gritty. Mm. Uh, the designers were not able to visit their buildings, so if they were designing uh, display spaces or plinths or cases or 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 or, uh, or display furniture or lighting and everything, we had to give them everything. Oh they God! Had, yeah. They had obviously um, uh, CAD to work with mm-hmm. through the building information management system that that was overseeing the is overseeing the entire project. But it's been a nightmare. And then, latterly, to get contractors who could work on the gallery and actually create it, building contractor to do the basic works of, you know, taking out strange extra supports from the gallery space mm-hmm. or laying a new floor or putting a lift in or mm-hmm. any of the other kinds of things, creating new openings in, through the walls. Mm-hmm. To get building contractor for that proved to be nearly impossible because... Once COVID had begun to ease, mm. you couldn't get a builder for love and money. Because everyone was so excited about getting all the work done. Yeah, everybody wanted building work done. Mm. And nobody wanted to work um, on a contract that could be problematic. Mm. And um, redeveloping, uh, redeveloping a building that was built in 1930 is nobody's mm. idea of a money spinner. No. <laughs> So we had a lot of trouble with that, and it took a lot of tinkering to get the contract um, into a, to get the tender documents into a form that was swallowable. Mm, mm. But we did we did in the end. Oh, we've got an good. excellent contractor. Has that local, affected your local crew. deadline? Well, we lost a year. Oh God, yeah. We lost a whole year, so we feel like we've been doing the TT gallery forever now. Yes, because <laughs> we started straight after military history in twenty eighteen. Yeah, and we're still. Still we're going. still at it. So Matthew and I were talking about which objects we were hoping to show, what the plan for mm. them was, how we were going to make it into, how we were going to get them into display condition and what, you know, what things were going to look like way back then. And we're in 22 now. Well, nearly not, aren't we? Nearly 23. Nearly 23. And um, we are aiming for an Easter opening. The gallery will be handed over to us by the builder on the 31st of January. Then the design team are coming in to build the set in February, and then um, the uh, various conservators who've been working on stuff for me are coming in towards the end of that month to install their mounted costumes and various mm-hmm. other kinds of things. Hi, Zenzi. Yeah, hi, Zenzi, yeah. Uh, notably, Zenzi Tinker. And then me and my team are going to be installing the rest of the exhibits in the display spaces in the month of March, and then we open for Easter, soft wow. opening. That is the pedal to the metal plan. Mm, yeah. 
Yeah, but it's been it's been really interesting. It's not been like any gallery display project, redisplay project or development that we've ever done before, because of the the quantity of remote conversations. The, yeah. The, the conservation thing was a disaster. Mm. The Zenzi couldn't come and of course she couldn't visit. Yeah. So they had all these. We tried. So I had a high definition camera, and we and we did um, we did um, Zoom or Teams, I think, where you know we had all the stuff out mm-hmm. in the room. And I say, what do you want to look at first? And she said, could you, could you focus on the lapel of that, you know, mm-hmm. of, of Beryl Swain's leathers, whatever. And so I'd hold the camera and zoom in. And at our end, we were getting really good video, mm. amazing quality yeah. video, and you could see everything. But at her end, because of bandwidth issues and all those oh, other kinds of things, of it was worse than useless. Mm. And um, I think... Th- I, to date, I don't even think that Zenzi has billed us for the time she spent on those on those um, interviews because they were just pointless. Mm. So we found that condition checking over the internet was disastrous. That was it, really interesting. It couldn't it couldn't work because you just can't see things. I think textiles, especially three dimensional textiles, are a peculiar thing mm. because you have to look at you have to look at the detail of the way the thing is constructed inside yeah. and out. You need to be able to manipulate it. Mm. You want to be able to look at the lining. You want to look inside the cuff. You want mm. to do whatever it is. And that is a real challenge. Mm. And it's that's not... quite significant for you being the sort of one of the few conservators on the island that if you want well, to bring... Well, there's only two of us, aren't there? Uh, well, exactly. Well, three of us right now because you're Yay! here. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You've got to yeah. bring someone over in that case because you know you've tried remote and it's not doable. Yes, what we eventually did was um, we managed to get to a point where Zenzi was happy to give us an envelope of cost, if you like, I hate that word, mm. but you know, uh, so that we knew roughly what we were aiming at trying to raise. Mm-hmm. And she, she worked with the, with the images and video and, and interpretations that I sent her to create some kind of uh, estimate Mm -hmm. and then we just we just had to uh contract her and send the stuff over to her Mm. and she properly saw it for the first time when she got it and it was that is an obviously a very great risk Mm. but the advantage of working with somebody like uh zenzi tinker and her colleagues is that they're so they're so experienced Mm. that whilst the problems that we were presenting to them were were quite novel particularly in the regard to, to the mounting of these mm. things, they made a very good they made a very good fist of assessing what, what we gave them. And it's turned out to be pretty accurate. So Brilliant. It, it was it it just was it just was it just was difficult. We did get latterly we got a visit from them. Anyway, so it's but that was that was particularly mm. horrible. Mm. We haven't contracted out we've done a bit of paintings conservation, but that's more straightforward for me. Mm, yeah. Um mm. But there are very few paintings in the TT gallery. Mm-hmm. But you've de- you've been sort of working with a number of different specialists of different things, haven't you? So we were talking earlier about the um, specialist mechanic that you've been working with on the bicycles and stuff. Yeah. So juggling all of that has been really yeah it's interesting. Easy to forget, actually, so we've... we've got mount makers. We've got um, We've got three different mount makers. So there's uh, Mike Penwolf, who works with Zenzi Tinker, who's created fantastic and innovative costume mounts mm-hmm. for the for the race mounted leathers that are going on the historic motorcycles. We've got Jeffrey Mitchell, who is uh, the former head of technical services here and a genius engineer, who's created novel mounts for the motorcycles themselves. Mm. Novel mounts that allowed them to be raked in racing poses mm, yeah. um, safely without being you know, intrusive Mm -hmm. to the viewer. And we've got um, the mount makers at the Creative Core uh, in Yorkshire, who are our design team, who've made um, the mounts for all the objects. Mm -hmm. And they had to make them without seeing the objects. Yay! (laughs) So that was extremely difficult. I had to make make cardboard mock-ups of some of the mounts and send them to them. There's a lot of measuring and a lot Mm. of head-scratching over the internet. So that's, you know, (laughs) hopefully that's going to work. So we've got all those mount makers, and then of course um, we've also got um, some of our motorcycles are in working order, and some of them are not. One of them, in particular, is an extremely significant motorcycle 
from 1979. And that's been worked on by uh, a famous race engineer here on the island, Anthony Amazing. Slick Bass, who's, uh, yeah, who's stripped it completely for us and identified, identified which components, internal components are original and which are not, mm. and um, has helped us. We have now discovered that we could probably rehabilitate that motorcycle into working order. So that would allow people at least to hear how it sounds. Mm, it's a beast. Yeah. So it's going yeah. to be not been run for about 40 years. So it'll be really interesting to hear that. Mm, amazing. So we have to coordinate all of this. Um, and everything comes together in the last week of February when all of these people who've never been able to visit and have never met descend. On the same day. <laughs> on the same day, on the same week. <laughs> And coordinate all of their various work strands. Amazing. And uh, during that last week of February, we're going to be putting all of those complicated displays of motorcycles, leathers and everything all, all together. And um, I think I might try and get some annual leave, actually, about that time. Uh, so that I'm not here for it. <laughs> well, in that case, I better say good luck. And it's all going to go absolutely fine. I know. It's going to be fine. Yeah, it, is. it is. It is. And everyone should come and visit. Oh, they should. In Easter. They should. There's never been a motorcycle display like it. It's going to be fab. Yeah. If you're enjoying the C word and would like to support our work, then please consider becoming one of our patrons. For as little as $1 per month, you can help us keep our episodes online and more of them coming. Patreon helps us meet our regular costs for the show, and also to plan ahead so we know roughly how much of a monthly budget we've got. That's super helpful when you're trying to do something special like buy a better microphone or save up to go to a special event. Your support also helps keep us free of advertisement. In return, our supporters get access to our archive of extended episodes, which you can only access on our Patreon page. Yeah, for that $1 a month, you get a little extra audio enjoyment. We've crunched the numbers, and it's about 10% extra content on a regular basis. Well, it's not bad for less than a cup of coffee, eh? If supporting us sounds like something you'd like to do, then head over to patreon.com slash the C word and join our bunch of absolute champions. Thanks for listening. We're the C word, and you've been listening to Sean Kelly, Chloe Rumsey, and me, Jenna Mathiason. Join us next time for our Christmas special. In the meantime, you can check out our website at theseaword.show, tweet us at the Seaword Podcast, or simply email us on theseawardpodcast at gmail.com. The intro and outro music is Spring by Dede Music, used under Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Kevin Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production. Honestly, I'm not. I just... Because it's like the, the it's like the, oh but, this is this is like a woman looking at a Weetabix she doesn't want to eat this is just like oh my god but it's good for us. <laughs>